Welcome everyone to the Mr. Mike Podcast, Wrong Answers Only, episode 26, with special guest Robert French. Robert French is a software developer turned actor turned author who was born in Oxford, England and was brought up in the East End of London. At age 26, he immigrated from the UK to Canada for a couple of years, although he stayed much longer. He has been there ever since. He is the writer of the seven so far Cal Rogan crime thrillers about a drug addicted ex-cop who fights his way from living rough on the streets to being a much sought after PI. Robert is passionate about the beauty of having the right words on the page and with every new book, his goal is to make it better than the previous one. I hope you enjoy this episode. I, I love Montreal. I grew up in, you know, people, we call it NDG, but I grew up in the Snowden area, along oh, yeah, the Perry yeah. Expressway. Yeah, yeah. In Montreal, you, you grew up in, in there. You're, you, I went to school in NDG. Uh, you're everywhere, right? So. Yeah. And then after eight years, where did you move to? Uh, then I moved, uh, my my company moved me to Toronto, which I hated. I, oh. I lasted six months in Toronto. Then I went to Calgary for a couple of years, then moved out to Vancouver. And which is your favorite city? Uh, i got to say Vancouver. Yeah. i got to say Vancouver, yeah. I love Montreal, um, but, you know, Vancouver is, uh, you know, the, w- the winters and the summers are so much better. <laughs> no, we don't have the snow in the winter, and we don't have the humidity in the summer. So, yeah, we, the humidity here is what kills us. Yeah, I know it's brutal. That's no, brutal, but yeah. Anyways, that's that's the weather forecast for Canadian cities for everybody who's uh, listening. Well, it's funny when uh, when I first moved to Vancouver, I had a guy working for me whose name was Bill English. Oh my goodness! And we figured that we got the problems of Canada sorted out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, anyways, uh, Robert French, not Robert English, and not Billy, not <laughs> Billy, <laughs> but Robert French, a software developer turned actor turned author, born in Oxford, England, and um, you were brought up in e- East the East End of London, and then at twenty six, you came, you well immigrated from the UK to Canada, and you weren't going to stay, but now you stayed. And how did you get to? How did you become a software developer? Is that what you always wanted to do? Well, uh, it was interesting. No, I, I, I really wanted to be an actor when I when I uh, was in high school, and but you know, I my dad was very much against that, and mm. this was in the nineteen sixties because I'm uh, I'm pretty old. Uh, so, and uh, my dad said to me, "You know, these computers are the coming thing. You should look at that." So I did, and uh, I got into the computer business and loved it. Um, it uh, you know, it's a very creative business um everything every 18 months everything changes yeah um and it's uh, which i really like and uh so that's uh, that's how I, I got into the computer business and and what and while you were uh working in the computer business you dabbled in some acting or you what was going on there yeah i i did a bit of acting um it was interesting that uh, after my dad died i got quite serious about acting and i, I took some acting courses from uh a great acting teacher, uh, Larry Silverberg, uh, who now teaches in New York, but at the time he was teaching in Seattle. So I go down to Seattle twice a week with uh, a couple of other Canadians, uh, and we took his classes. And uh, but I I realized pretty pretty quickly that it's difficult to make a career out of acting um, because so much is out of your control. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, ultimately, everything's out of our control. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of uh, acting, you know, you you may be perfect for a part, but in a casting director's eyes, he or she has got this image that they they've got in their mind, and you're not it. And uh, at that time, I uh, I was a, a partner in a, a software company, and. We'd raised a bunch of money, um, developed some software, and we were looking to raise some more money. But then uh, there was a high-tech bubble at the time that burst, 
and we couldn't raise our money. So um, uh, that all fell apart. And But one of the great things about it falling apart was it gave me uh, a chance to try doing some writing. Right. That's what got me started. So, um, so that's what, uh, out of the ashes of that. Out of the ashes from computer software developer into writing. But you, I would imagine, I would imagine you always were interested in writing. You can, it's not something you mm-hmm. just kind of, you're like, okay, I'll take a stab at a book, but it's not something somebody just picks up and says, I'm going to be a writer today. It's, you had those stories, you maybe had those ideas or you dabbled in some, some writing prior to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. When I was in my early 20s, I wrote a book of horror stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote them on an old Underwood typewriter, and uh, I've got a cabinet just to my left here. They're in the bottom of that cabinet. <laughs> um, and uh, at the time, I had no idea how you'd go about getting getting a book published. So I just kind of put them to one side and got on with my career. But I've always had that desire to to write. You know, Occasionally, you'll, you'll read a book. And you'll think, I could have written a better book than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're wrong. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I know. I, I've had those moments, but, uh, I, I'm not the type of person to be able to sit down and write a novel. I, I dabbled, I dabbled in some short stories that I have, uh, picture books for, ch- for, for children. Oh, um, nice. Poetry that I, I've been writing since I was 16, but it's more, I, I don't take it too seriously. I, I, I self-published my poetry book. I tell people all the time as a, as a, just like a, on a whim for my, my concussion recovery. And, you know, uh, I could never do what you're doing with, with writing stories. I don't have that skill set. So whenever I have somebody like yourself on, I find it fascinating because there's so much work that goes involved in it. Like, how, where do you find the time if you're working full time? Are you work, you're writing at night? You're writing during the day? Do you ever sleep? What's the editing process? Like, there's so many questions that goes into it. But and and you have tons of books that that you've written so far, but uh, we'll go to your first book. What was the first book you wrote and published? When I first started writing, I was working under the assumption of, "Hey, I've read a lot of books. I must know how to write one." <laughs> and so I started, I think, four books and was unable to finish any of them um, because the, I kind of got bogged down with them. And finally, I wrote a book from beginning to end, and I thought. Hey, this is pretty good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this published. So I uh, sent out, sent it out to over a hundred agents and publishers. Wow. And got back 70 rejection letters. And as luck would have it, I discovered that in, in Vancouver, there's this uh, writers conference in Surrey. Every, uh, every year they have this big conference. And I went to the conference and I met an editor there. And she did a, a review of the book and she told me everything that was wrong with it. I completely switched what I was doing. I took a bunch of courses and she was wonderful because she mentored me through my first two books um, and did the editing for me. And uh, although that cost me quite a bit of money, it right. was worth every single penny because she turned me from somebody with a bunch of writing ideas into somebody who could actually write publishable stuff. Right, but she gave you invaluable tips and information. and Yeah, yeah. The one thing that I learned that is important, no matter what you're writing, and it probably even applies to poetry, is that you've got to have a tension on every page of that book. There's got to be something that is driving the reader on to read the next page, something that they they really want to find out, or something that... They found out, but they want to find out more. Mm. And uh, that was the thing that that's the thing that I really focus on when I'm when I'm writing. Recently, I was writing a chapter of my latest book. I found the chapter a bit dull, so I uh, my protagonist, who's a private eye, him and his partner were discussing their big case, and I I thought this is getting a bit dull. I had somebody run into their office with blood oil in their face. And I thought, you know, that'd be pretty good. Got to find a reason why now. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's what you have to do. You have to have something changing all the time. Right. Got to keep. Uh, you got to got. You got to keep uh, hooking people in with this. Mm-hmm. The, ne- the next part of the next door opening and the next. But yeah, there goes. That's how a novel's read. Like you, re- you look back or you think back to all the novels you've read, and you're like, what? What interested you in those stories? And then how can you? Mm-hmm. 
kind of do that with your stories. But you wrote seven books so far, correct? For the That's Cal right. Ro- yeah. Okay, it's Cal Rogan crime thir- uh, thrillers about a drug addicted ex cop who fights his way from a living rough on the streets to being a much sought after PI. So where is the inspiration for uh, for this? Well, I'll tell you, it's uh, started uh, the first Cal Rogan book. Uh, in 2009, I think I started it. And the editor that I mentioned was in town and I was doing a software contract to keep, you know, writers need to have a, at that time I needed a, a second job to support my writing habit. And this contract was in the downtown east side of Vancouver, which is a fairly sketchy part of town. Mm-hmm. And every day I'd walk past this alley and it was just full of drug addicts. They would use it for their bedroom, their bathroom, their kitchen, place to shoot up their drug. And this alley kind of freaked me out. And one morning I was having breakfast with my editor and I said to her, I told her about the alley and I I said, I got obsessed with this idea. You know, what would it be like to wake up in an alley like that? Yeah. I mean, just imagine waking up in that alley. And she said, yeah, who would wake up in an alley like that? We chatted about it. We came up with the idea. It would be kind of ironic if it was a cop <laughs> who woke up in the alley. And so that's how the, the first book, the first chapter of the first book is Cal Rogan is waking up in that alley and he's covered in blood and he doesn't know why. And he's a heroin addict, uh, which is unusual. You cops that are addicts are usually cocaine addicts, but there's a backstory as to why he's a heroin addict. And, um, he wakes up in an, a- an alley, and that's how the whole series started. I thought it was just going to be one book. But when I got to the end of the first book, I thought, yeah, it's got to be a second book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it started off with a bang. I, I I could visualize it just by you describing him waking up in the alleyway. Like, that's yeah. it's incredible. Yeah, I'm sure in, in parts of Montreal you have alleys where homeless people congregate and so, uh, yeah, you know, but unfortunately, right, that uh, seems to be a, a big issue in, in a lot of the Canadian cities now. And it is the same thing with the American cities, Seattle, San Francisco. Uh, the, yeah, it's um, Montreal. I've seen my fair share of stuff walking around at late nights. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, uh, people think it's safe. And generally, you know, uh, street life in Montreal is safe unless you're involved in organized crime. But there are some areas in Montreal where people should be careful walking alone at night. But well, I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. So you got to the end of the first book and you're like, I have to write a second book. And at this point, you're just like, well, this this is going to turn into multiple books. Like, I, I'm just going to keep going. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm definitely just going to keep going. Somebody uh, asked me, you know, what, have you thought about uh, stopping writing at some point? And I paraphrased Charlton Heston. And I said, I'll stop writing when they pry my computer out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a great attitude. You love it. So yeah. you wrote your first book and then your second and, and your third and so on. So at this point now, it, is the story coming off the, the end of your fingertips easily? Are you, is it coming out naturally? Is it taking less time to write the story? As opposed to writing the first one? No. Um, I'm a fairly slow writer. Uh, I, you know, I'm really, I really care about the, the words on the page that, you know, that, that I express things with the right words. So, um, I can, I usually finish a book in six months or so. And, uh, the, you know, the first three books I was working part time on them because I was, also still doing consulting work in the computer business. Right. It was uh, when I when I was finishing the third book that I ran across a, a course. I, I'd self-published the book. Right. Um, and I'd run across this course uh, called uh, Self-Publishing 101. And I took the course and learned all the things that I, I, I didn't know about self-publishing. And, uh, once I'd taken that course, um, and I, you know, I had then had three books, things started to escalate a bit for me, you know, started to get some success. Over time, I've written the seven books, the eighth one I'm working on right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm also working on a ninth one wow. set in the year 2024, uh, 2044, sorry, 2044, in which my my protagonist, Cal Rogan's daughter, who's a kid in the in the books that I'm writing about him, she is a cop in the future, and she's investigating a murder 
that couldn't be committed today. Interesting. Yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with that. Excellent. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm on your webpage right now, and I'm actually perusing the covers. Who designed the covers? A guy called Nick Castle. He's uh, I found him on uh, Readsy, which is a, a site for, for for finding people who support the publishing business. Yeah, he's a wonderful designer. Uh, he's in England, and uh, uh, he's on vacation at the moment. But uh, when he gets back, he's going to present me some designs for the eighth book that I'm writing right now. I like his style. Yeah, he, he's pretty good. Yeah, and they're uniform very well. Like they all have their own theme, their own colors for every for every book. But it's, um, the same kind of theme with the guy with the detective walking, and you kind of see him from behind in the silhouette. And yeah, it's very it's very well done. Yeah, he's he's a great uh, a great designer and a really nice guy too. So I'm really yeah. lucky to have found him. And on to, on your website also, you've done you you write some blogs and you have a. Uh, well, you keep up to date with your with some of your blogs, Barry. And the last one you wrote was on writing and publishing. So, yeah, I imagine with all your expertise now with public self publishing, did you did you ever take your? I mean, you said you got you know like seventy rejection letters, sending a bunch of inquiries. So, have you tried to go through a traditional route for other novels, or you, at this point, you're just like, no, I'm just doing this myself now. No, I'm just I'm just doing it myself. I, I'm what you call a mid list author, right? If you're a mid-list author with a traditional publisher, you don't make much money at all. Mm -hmm. You make, you know, a, a buck a book or something, depending on how much the book is. But you get you get you get about ten percent of the revenue when you publish yourself through Amazon or Kobo or Barnes and Noble or whoever. You get seventy percent. Right. And so a mid-list publisher will make more money self-publishing than. Uh, traditional publishing yeah so it's it's difficult I, I went through the process for the self-publishing for my poetry book and then i saw the the pay schemes for that for your books and i know i have a lot of writers and authors that follow me on twitter and a lot of them do exactly what you're doing they're self-publishing where they go through the amazon route because um, by the time you wait around to be told no and, mm -hmm. and if you even get your foot in the door especially with the pandemic in the last couple of years a lot of publishers were saying no to people because there was a lot of uncertainty going around with with uh, mm -hmm. what are we going to do? Are people buying books? Are they allowed to go to stores? But um, yeah, I, I think it's really uh, interesting that you were able to go about this, and it looks like you've done a miraculous job with all these books and these publishing. And um, so, in terms of your your writing setup, do you, do you have a little corner? Do you have a nice room? Do you go lock yourself in the basement? Do you go outside? What, what's your writing process like, and where do you do it? I, I do it at the Vancouver Public Library, oh. which is a fantastic building, uh, downtown Vancouver. And it's about a 15-minute walk from my house uh, where I'm living now. I've, uh, I'm have i always there when the doors open, and I've got a desk, that, that same desk I always go to and sit and, and work. You know, it's a great environment to, to write in because it's quiet and uh, you know, there are no distractions. Um, now, during COVID, I couldn't do that. I was working from home. And I don't work nearly as effectively from home as I do at the library. Um, so I get a lot more words on the page when I'm in the library. I do I do a lot better when I'm home. As long as I face where I have the door closed, whatever the case may be, if it's, it's, if it's work for school, if it's uh, my night classes that I'm taking, or if it's uh, podcasting, editing, I... You know, uh, actually, my earphones really help because it's kind of almost like silencing headphones. I can tune out everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm the opposite. Uh, I've tried. I, you know, go to a coffee shop. It's too noisy. The mm -hmm. library is too quiet sometimes for me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I like to have some music on and different things like that. But that's 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 really interesting. And I imagine as a regular going to the library, you, you must see people on a regular basis that you know or you recognize. It's kind of like. Oh, that's Bob over there. He, mm. he usually comes on Sundays, and the the librarian yeah. knows me. Yeah, so yeah. Nice. it is. Yeah, there's uh, there's one uh, guy who's uh, uh, quite often sits in the desk uh, opposite me, and uh, he's an artist. He does his art with uh, on pen and paper. Quite often, he's there doing his art, which is really nice. Yeah, it's great. I've got my library buddies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the library is uh, is, is just. It's so nice. I love the smell of books and I love that environment. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I haven't been to, I, I usually 
go with my wife and we go peruse bookstores like uh, either the, the chapters of indigo or local bookstores mm-hmm. when we're around in areas like in montreal has a bunch of local bookstores and i i love i love that experience right so mm-hmm. but in terms of in terms of uh writing you also do personal journals and you've been and you've been doing personal journals for a while or how or are you still doing personal journals? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, no, I, I write. I write blog posts from time to time. Yeah. Uh, but I don't do much personal journals any, anymore. One of the one of the big things that uh, that I'm very starting to get more and more involved in is the issue of drugs and you know, what we what we should do about it. And one of the things that I think we should absolutely do. For all drugs, not just, not just marijuana, but for everything is we should make them legal and controlled. Mm -hmm. Treat them just like alcohol and tobacco. Let the tobacco companies and the the alcohol uh, and the booze companies, Seagrams, for example, let them manufacture the various drugs under controlled conditions like we do with alcohol and tobacco. That they're sold exactly the same way as alcohol and tobacco, you know, out of liquor stores or even out of a Seven Eleven. But you've got to prove your identity and you know your, your age and so on. Um, because right now, with uh, with drugs illegal, it's easier for a kid to pick up cocaine at school than it is for him to buy a six pack of beer. It's true. Yeah. So I, I think we need to legalize them, and then. When somebody's t- buying a drug, a, a legal drug, they know exactly how much dosage of heroin is in this package. Um, and they know there's no fentanyl laced in it. And so that's where we, I believe we need to go. Take the business out of the hands of the criminals and put it into the hands of uh, companies. I mean, some of those are pretty criminal, but, but nevertheless, you're better off with companies that you can control. Well, Colorado and the United States, they legalized marijuana for a number number of years and the taxes they've collected from it's really mm-hmm. helped them inject that money back into the system. And then they did it here. And in Quebec, we have the uh, what they call the S, uh, SDQC, I think I believe it is. That's their like local marijuana shops. And you can go in there and they have detailed pamphlets on every single form of marijuana you have. And you have night and you have day and you have all this. And I'm thinking about it. Going back to, you know, when I was younger, the, all the friends that I had, and I never did any of it. I never did the recreational stuff. I, I, I'm i not a drinker. I don't do anything like that. But my friends grew up. They all did it. Everybody in high school did it. And where were they getting it? They were going to the, the metro or the local, uh, you know, they had a spot they went to at the park. And they would buy off these drug dealers. And sometimes some of them got, you know, pretty sick or messed up because the, th- the stuff they were buying was not controlled. And... um you know, they, we don't yeah. know. We don't know if it was laced. We don't know what they added to them. Uh, and just yeah, that's right. It's like the cocaine. I know for a number of years here, there was cocaine being pushed around because it was it's dirt cheap for in comparison to other things. And you know, there was glass. They're putting glass in it, breaking up and, and passing around. So there's stories going around that when I was younger. And um, I'm with you. I, I think uh, I think a more controlled version of the system would help save a lot of lives. And you know, you would be able to. Not that you want to monetize it, but you would be able to put a tax or a number on it, and then you would eliminate a lot of the the criminal uh, underground that's behind it. And mm-hmm. yeah, you know. yeah, because you, you could sell it a lot cheaper as well. You know, the, the criminals make money because their markup is so huge. But if you're selling it, you know, if people can get it legally. Another benefit is there's a lot of petty crime from drug addicts who need money to feed their habit. Yeah. If 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 the price is less, they don't need to do that crime. There's a whole bunch of benefits to, to legalize. Yeah, and outside of writing and outside of uh, your well, you're you're not doing software developing anymore. But what else? Uh, do you have any other hobbies? Anything else that keeps you busy? Uh, yeah, I play bridge. Uh, I'm a uh, I'm a, a an avid bridge player. Every Monday night, so I'll be doing it in a few hours. Uh, every Monday night, I play bridge with a bunch of friends. And uh, so that's one of the things that uh, that I do. But apart from that, I don't have have many hobbies. I just don't don't have time for them. You know, uh, despite my uh, many years, I've got an eleven year old son, and uh, he's. Uh, we decided during COVID to homeschool him. Okay. 
And he has been doing so well at homeschooling that, you know, we, we're going to keep that up. Um, you know, he's 11, but he's doing work that kids in school do at age 14 and 15. Yeah. So uh, that takes up, obviously it's summer, it's summer holidays now, but that takes up quite a bit of my time as well. I, I heard a, lot of, a bunch of stories from people in the last couple of years that homeschooled their children. And for a lot of them, it was just a, it was a really pleasant experience. Oh, it's great. Less travel, more, you can be more flexible, your home, you could focus on what you need to focus on. And just, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm a elementary school teacher. I work with children with autism, but school life is very busy. I mean, often in Quebec, uh, sometimes the, the elementary schools run like a high school because there's so many students or they're so busy, mm -hmm. depending on what school you're in. So, uh, yeah. And, you know, even the Zoom I would say for the most part during the pandemic with the with the Zoom teaching, for a lot of kids, it's very hard to sit in the front of a Zoom screen like this and learn for five to eight hours. Mm -hmm. For other students who are into tech, oh, they love it. Like they can mm -hmm. or give them a computer at home and they'll write all day, tell their stories da, 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 and, and just do research. So, I mean, there's pros and cons, but I hear more and more people doing homeschooling and they really enjoy it. Yeah, it's, it's working well. Um... Um, for a start, we we only need to do like three or four hours a day. We've been wor working through the, the curriculum, standard government curriculum, because you need to do that. Yeah. But we've got all sorts of side projects. Uh, we did a construction project. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, he wrote he wrote a, an essay on nuclear energy. Wow. And uh, you know we've done all sorts of little projects that have, have been great. I mean, his latest thing is his. Uh, He's learning piano, and uh, so you know, that all becomes part of his his school work. So uh, yeah, we're having a we're having a great time. Another another project we took on was we decided we wanted to learn how to do Rubik's cube. Yeah, <laughs> both of us can can solve Rubik's cube. He just does it a lot faster than me. There's a there's a podcaster that I connected with earlier. Uh, in the year, I think it was before June. Um, I've met him on Facebook. He's on YouTube. His podcast is called The Human Podcast. And one of his early episodes, he's he's located in the UK. So one of his early episodes, he, he interviews people from all over the UK and, and different fields. It, off the top of my head, I know the guy, the man is a Rubik's Cube champion of some sorts. So if you ever have a chance, the Human Podcast on YouTube, check him out. It's one of his earlier episodes. So if you're into the Rubik's Cube, he goes into talking about it, and and he can literally solve the Rubik's uh, the Rubik's Cube in like ten seconds. He goes, Ch -ch -ch -ch. yeah, it's amazing. Those guys. Uh, uh, my my son, we we learned the standard method, and he got his best speed down to about thirty five seconds. Wow! But he's been learning the professional method as well, the one that those guys use yeah uh but it's a lot harder it's a lot harder to yeah, do. No. i i it would still take me three hours to try to get one side together i don't <laughs> <laughs> what well, well, there's a there's a great uh for, for people who might be interested there's a great podcast by a a, a guy who published who published who works for wired magazine and he's got a great um not podcast youtube video on how to solve the Rubik's Cube. Yeah. It's about a 45-minute video, but it's, it's really, really good. That's where we learned. Now I'm going to have to start showing the kindergarten kids at school the Rubik's Cube videos and get them to do it. Yeah, for sure. They'll learn fast. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty cool. So I always plug everybody's uh, social medias. Uh, your website's robertpfrench.com. You're mm -hmm. on Facebook, Robert P. French author, and you're also on LinkedIn. Well, look up. Robert French, I mean, there's a bunch of numbers right there on the on the actual link, but Robert French on uh, LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I don't know if you're on Twitter. I, I do have an account on Twitter, but I've found that Twitter has become such a, a toxic place. I don't want to go there anymore. I try to stay away from the the toxic environment and I do my mm -hmm. shtick with people. And um, it's been it's helped me get through the pandemic with mental health and just mm -hmm. being isolated and, and those things. So it's kind of I guess it kind of snowballed a bit, but I, I spend a lot more time on there than anything else for than social medias. You know, if you want to send me an email, tag me in any of your stuff that's coming out, or if you have book signings or your, when your book comes out, I will be more than happy to share with everybody on Twitter and on, I appreciate Inst that. on, on Instagram. Uh, I, I tell everybody the same thing. Like, don't, it's not a, bother me, message me anytime. 
I'm going to tag everybody in as their episodes come out throughout the year. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure, Robert. Honestly, oh, I really, great, enjoy, really enjoyed talking to you and I, I look forward and maybe we'll do it again in the future. I would love that. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. It's been great. Nice and relaxing and fun. I, I just, I'm on my third coffee today, so. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. So uh, thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Mr. Mike podcast, Wrong Answers Only. Everyone who appears on our podcast will have a guest profile. So please, when you're done this, Go check out Robert French's profile and check out some of his links and check out his books. Don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms, Twitter and Instagram, Mr. Mike MTL, Wrong Answers MTL, both on Twitter, both on Instagram. As always, our website is MrMikeMTL.com and all our episodes will be there. All the guest profiles will be there. So feel free to peruse. Donate, share, tell your friends and family, tell the people at the grocery store, the garage when you're getting your oil changed, when your tires are changed. Go tell the people on the street. We truly appreciate your support, and we'll see you next time.